The Courage of Truth, lectures by Michel Foucault at the College of France, 1983 and 84. Uh, lecture one, the second hour, given on February 1984. I have tried then to pick out the relationships and differences between the periastic mode of truth-telling and first the prophetic mode of truth-telling and then that of wisdom and now I would like to indicate very schematically and elusively some of the relations between periastic veridiction and the veridiction of someone who teaches. I would prefer to say <coughs> I would prefer to say basically of the technician. These characters, the doctor, the musician, the shoemaker, the carpenter, the teacher of armed combat, the gymnastics teacher, frequently mentioned by Plato in his Socratic and other dialogues, possess a knowledge characterized as techni, know-how, that is to say, entailing particular items of knowledge but taking shape in a practice and involving for their apprenticeship not only a theoretical knowledge but a whole exercise a whole akesis or maliti they possess this knowledge they profess it and they are capable of teaching it to others the technician who possesses a techni has learned it and is capable of teaching it is someone obliged to speak the truth or at any rate to formulate what he knows and pass it on to others and of course this distinguishes him from the sage after all the technician has a certain duty to speak. He is obliged, in a way, to tell the knowledge he possesses and the truth he knows. Because this knowledge and truth are linked to a whole weight of tradition. This man of techni would not himself have been able to learn anything and today would know nothing at all or very little if there had not been before him a technician technitis like him who had taught him whose pupil he had been and who had been his teacher and just as he would not have learned anything if someone had not previously told him what they knew, so, in the same way, he will have to pass on his knowledge so that it does not die with him. So, in this idea of someone with knowledge of technique, someone who has received this knowledge and must pass it on there is the principle of an obligation to speak which is not found in the sage but is found in the parisiest but clearly this teacher this man of technique of expertise and teaching does not take any risk in the truth-telling he has received and must pass on. And this is what 
distinguishes him from the Parisiast. Everyone knows, and I know first of all, that you do not need courage to teach. On the contrary, the person who teaches, establishes, or at any rate, hopes or sometimes wants to establish a bond of shared knowledge, of heritage, of tradition, and possibly also of personal recognition or friendship between himself and the person or persons who listen to him. Anyway, this truth-telling establishes a filiation in the domain of knowledge. Now, we have seen that the Parisiist, to the contrary, takes a risk. He risks the relationship he has with the person to whom he speaks. And in speaking the truth, far from establishing this positive bond of shared knowledge, heritage, filiation, gratitude, or friendship, he may instead provoke the other's anger, antagonize an enemy. He may arouse the hostility of the city, or, if he is speaking the truth to a bad and tyrannical sovereign, he may provoke vengeance and punishment. And he may go so far as to risk his life since he may pay with his life for the truth he has told. Whereas, in the case of the technician's truth-telling, teaching ensures the survival of knowledge. The person who practices parasia risks death. The technician's and teacher's truth-telling brings together and binds. The Parisiast's truth-telling risks hostility, war, hatred, and death. And if the Parisiast's truth may unite and reconcile, when it is accepted and the other person agrees to the pact, and plays the game of Parisia, this is only after it has opened up an essential, fundamental, and structurally necessary moment of the possibility of hatred and a rupture. We can say then, very schematically, that the Parasiast is not the prophet who speaks the truth when he reveals fate enigmatically in the name of someone else. The Parasiast is not a sage who, when he wants to and against the background of his silence, tells of being and nature in the name of wisdom. The Parasiast is not the professor or teacher, the expert who speaks of techni in the name of a tradition. So he does not speak of fate, being, or techni. Rather, inasmuch as he takes the risk of provoking war with others, rather than solidifying the traditional bond, like the teacher, or by speaking in his own name, and perfectly clearly. <laughs> Unlike the prophet who speaks in the name of someone else, inasmuch as, finally, he tells the truth <clears throat> of what is in the singular form, 
of individuals and situations and not the truth of being and the nature of things. The Parasiast brings into play the true discourse of what the Greeks called ethos. Fate has a modality of veridiction which is found in prophecy. Being has a modality of veridiction found in the sage. Techni has a modality of veridiction found in the technician, the professor, the teacher, the expert. And finally, ethos has its veridiction in the speech of the Parisiest in the game of Parisia. Prophecy, wisdom, teaching, and Parisia are, I think, four modes of veridiction which involve different personages. Second, call for different modes of speech. And third, relate to different domains, fate, being, techni, ethos. Actually, in this survey, I am not essentially defining four historically distinct social types. I do not mean that there were four professions or four social types in ancient civilization. The prophet, the sage, the teacher, and the Parasiast. Certainly, it may be that these four major modalities of truth-telling, prophetic, wise, technical, and ethical, or Parasiastic, correspond to quite distinct institutions or practices or personages. One of the reasons why the example of antiquity is privileged is precisely that it enables us to separate out, as it were, these different modalities of truth-telling these different modes of veridiction. Because in antiquity, they are fairly clearly distinguished and embodied, formulated, and almost institutionalized in different forms. There is the prophetic function, which was quite clearly defined and institutionalized. The character of the sage was also clearly picked out. See the portrait of Heraclitus. <clears throat> you see the teacher, the technician, the man of techni appeared very clearly in the Socratic dialogues. The sophists were precisely these kinds of of technicians and teachers who have claimed to have a universal function. As for the Parisiest, his specific profile appears very clearly. We will come back to this next week with Socrates and then with Diogenes and a series of other philosophers. However, as distinct as these roles may be, and even if at certain times and in certain societies or civilizations, you see these four functions taken on, as it were, by very clearly distinct institutions or characters. It is important to note that 
Fundamentally, these are not social characters or roles. I insist on this. I would like to stress it. They are essentially modes of veridiction. It sometimes happens, and it will happen very often, even more often than not, that these modes of veridiction are combined with each other, and we find them in forms of discourse, types of institutions, and social characters which mix the modes of veridiction with each other. Already you can see how Socrates puts together elements of prophecy, wisdom, teaching, and parasia. Socrates is the parasiest, but you recall who gave him his function as parasiest his mission to question people, to take them by the sleeve and tell them, take some care of yourself. It was the Delphic God, the prophetic authority which returned this verdict. When asked who was the wisest man in Greece, it replied, Socrates. And it was in order to honor this prophecy, and also to honor the Delphic God laying down the principle of know yourself, that Socrates undertook his mission. His function as Parasiast is not, therefore, unrelated to this prophetic function from which he nevertheless maintains his distinctness. Equally, although a Parisiist, Socrates has a relationship with wisdom. This is evident in several traits. His personal virtue, his self-control, his abstention from all pleasures, his endurance in the face of all kinds of suffering, and his ability to detach himself from the world. You recall the famous scene in which Socrates becomes insensible, remaining immobile, impervious to the cold when he was a soldier at war. We should also not forget that Socrates has that, in a sense, even more important feature of wisdom, which is a particular kind of silence, regardless of everything, because Socrates does not speak. He does not deliver speeches. He does not say spontaneously what he knows. On the contrary, he claims to be someone who does not know and who, not knowing, and knowing only that he does not know, will remain reserved and silent, confining himself to questioning. Questioning is, if you like, a particular way of combining the essential reserve of this sage, who remains silent with the duty of parasia, that is to say, the duty to challenge and speak. Except that the sage remains silent because he knows 
and has the right not to speak of his knowledge. Whereas Socrates remains silent by saying that he does not know, and by questioning everyone and anyone in the manner of the Parasiast. So here again you can see that the Parasiastic feature combines with the features of wisdom. And finally, of course, there is the relationship with the technician, the teacher. The Socratic problem is how to teach the virtue and knowledge required to live well or also to govern the city properly. You recall the Alcibiads. You recall too, we will come back to this next week, the end of the Lash, where Socrates agrees to teach the sons of Lysimachus and Milesius to take care of themselves. So Socrates is the Parisiest, but once again with a permanent, essential relationship to the prophetic veridiction, the veridiction of wisdom, and the technical veridiction of teaching. So, prophecy, wisdom, teaching, technique, and parasia should be seen much more as fundamental modes of truth-telling than as characters. There is the modality which speaks enigmatically about that which is hidden from every human being. There is the modality of truth-telling, which speaks apoptictically about being, thesis, and the order of things. There is the veridiction which speaks demonstratively about kinds of knowledge and expertise. There is finally the veridiction which speaks polemically about individuals and situations. These four modes of truth-telling are, I believe, absolutely fundamental for the analysis of discourse to the extent that in discourse the subject who tells the truth is constituted for himself and for others. I think that since Greek culture, the subject who tells the truth takes these four possible forms. He is either prophet or sage or technician or parisiast. It would be interesting to investigate how these four modalities, which again, once and for all, are not identified with roles or characters, are combined in different cultures, societies, or civilizations, in different modes of discursivity, in what could be called the different regimes of the truth found in different societies. It seems to me, at any rate, this is what I have tried to show you. However, schematically, that in Greek culture at the end of the 5th and the beginning of the 4th century BC, we, find, we can find these four major modes of veridiction distributed in a kind of rectangle that of prophecy and fate, that of wisdom and being, and that of teaching and techni, and that of parasia and ethos. 
but if these four modalities are thus quite clearly decipherable, separable, and separated from each other at this time, one of the features of the history of ancient philosophy, and also no doubt of ancient culture generally, is that there is a tendency for the mode of truth-telling characteristic of wisdom and the mode of truth-telling characteristic of parasia to come together, join together, to link up with each other in a sort of philosophical modality of truth-telling, which is very different from prophetic truth-telling as well as from the teaching of technai, of which rhetoric is an example. We will see a philosophical truth-telling separating off, or any way, the development of a philosophical truth-telling which will ever more insistently claim to speak of being or the nature of things only to the extent that this truth-telling concerns is relevant for is able to articulate and found a truth-telling about ethos in the form of parasia. And to that extent, we can say that only up to a certain point, of course, wisdom and parasia merge. Anyway, it is as though they are attracted to each other, that there is something like a phenomenon of gravitation of wisdom and parasia, a gravitation which manifests itself in the famous characters of philosophers telling the truth of things, but above all, telling their truth to men throughout Hellenistic and Roman or Greco-Roman culture. If you like, there is the possibility of an analysis of a history of the regime of truth concerning the relations between parasia and wisdom. If we take up again these four major fundamental modes I have been talking about, we could say that the medieval Christianity produced other groupings. Greco-Roman philosophy brought together the modalities of parasia and wisdom. It seems to me that in medieval Christianity, we see another type of grouping bringing together the prophetic and parisiastic modalities. The two modalities of telling the truth about the future, about what is hidden from men by virtue of their finitude and the structure of time. <coughs> about what awaits men and the imminence of the still hidden event. And then telling the truth to men about what they are, where were brought together in a number of particular types of discourses. <coughs> and also institutions. I am thinking of preaching and preachers, especially of those preachers starting with the Franciscans and Dominicans, who played an absolutely major role across the Western world and throughout the Middle Ages in the perpetuation but also renewal and transformation of 
the experience of threat for the medieval world. These great preachers played the role of both prophet and Parisius in that society. Those who speak of the threatening imminence of the future, of the kingdom of the last day, of the final judgment, or of approaching death, at the same time tell men what they are, and tell them frankly, with complete parasia, what their faults and crimes are, and in what respects and how they must change their mode of being. Counterposed to this, it seems to me that the same medieval society, the same medieval civilization, tended to bring together the other two modes of their addiction. That of wisdom, which tells of the being of things and their nature, and that of teaching, telling the truth of being and telling the truth of knowledge was the task of an institution which was as specific to the Middle Ages as was preaching the university. Preaching and the university appear to me to be institutions specific to the Middle Ages, in which we see the functions I have spoken about grouping together in pairs and defining a regime of veridiction, a regime of truth-telling, which is very different from the regime we could find in the Hellenistic and Greco-Roman world where instead it was parasia and wisdom that were combined. And what about the modern epic, you may ask? I don't really know. I would no doubt have to be analyzed. We could say perhaps, but these are hypotheses. Not even hypotheses, some almost incoherent remarks that you find the prophetic modality of truth-telling in some political discourses, in revolutionary discourse, in modern society, revolutionary discourse, like all prophetic discourse, speaks in the name of someone else speaks in order to tell of a future which, up to a point, already has the form of a fate. The ontological modality of truth-telling, which speaks of the being of things, would no doubt be found in a certain modality of philosophical discourse. The technical modality of truth-telling is organized much more around science than teaching, or at any rate, around a complex formed by scientific and research institutions and teaching institutions. And the periastic modality has, I believe, precisely disappeared as such. And we no longer find it except where it is grafted on or underpinned by one of these three modalities. Revolutionary discourse plays the role of peri Parisiastic discourse when it takes the form of a critique 
of existing society. Philosophical discourse as analysis, as reflection on human finitude and the criticism of everything which may exceed the limits of human finitude. Whether in the realm of knowledge or the realm of morality, plays the role of parasia to some extent. And when the scientific discourse is deployed as criticism of prejudices, of existing forms of knowledge, of dominant institutions, of current ways of doing things, and it cannot avoid doing this in its very development. It plays this peri parisiastic role. That's what I wanted to say to you. That's the end of part one of The Courage of Truth, Lectures by Michel Foucault, College of France, 1984-80, 1984.